Houston. How many of you glad to be here tonight? Just out of curiosity, how many of you wish you were somewhere else? Just so I know what kind of crowd I'm talking to. Okay, oh, I got, okay, I got one over there. I got one over there. I got one over there, but I'm not going to say who it is, okay? I, I, take your Bible out if you would, and let's go ahead and turn to the book of Exodus chapter 18, and we'll be in there in just a second. Uh, before we go there and read, though, um, why, I'm just asking two questions here and I want to just get some responses from you and see what your opinion is on these particular responses. Why do we need leaders at Regional Heights Baptist Church? Uh, got to have some direction. Got to have some people to follow. What, what else? Because I'm exhausted. Because you're exhausted? Okay, all right, okay, all right. Any other reasons why we need some leaders? My, what, what do leaders do? I mean, what? Make things happen, make things happen or, or kind of organize things to get them to happen or get in the work with well, What are some characteristics of a good leader? What, uh, y'all describe a good leader to me. Give me, give me something what that looks like. A good Go, oh, they can, when, you, when you talk to them and you tell them things, they actually listen to what you have to say and then act on what it is that you talk to them about, okay? Okay, sound to me like you hit about five things in there, but we're going to identify, the leader's going to help identify what needs to be done, figure out what needs to be done, go back and communicate it to his, to his or her group so that that group can go and get it done. Is that close to what you're saying? Got to, they got to be, what if they're not respected? So you're telling me that, well, how do they get respected? Oh, come on. You mean to tell me how a leader lives their life will affect how people whether follow them or not? I would think so, too. We're going we're gonna to see that in the scripture we look at tonight. It doesn't make a big difference. All right, anybody else got one you want to add? It's what you th oh, you, you, would you rather follow somebody who knows what they're talking about? Okay. All right. Yeah, that's good. Wisdom. Wisdom in there. All right, I want to take you to a, to a time in Exodus chapter 18, verse 19. And Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Three times in Scripture it says that the most humble man on the face of the earth was Moses. Now I want to make sure and see if you've been listening. What is biblical humility? Does anybody remember what it is? You can just do it in your own words, but what is that? Knowing who you am, kind of, kind of. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. Humility is realizing that you can't, but he can. Amen. All right. Did Moses think he could? He absolutely was certain that he could not, right? That's one of the reasons God chose him, because he knew that he couldn't do it. So he didn't get messed up in his own strength, because his, his doubts for himself was part of the thing that God made him usable. So uh, we're, I just want to look at that text tonight where his uh, father-in-law, how many of y'all got a father-in-law? Right, father-in-law. Have you ever had a father-in-law give you advice? Does every man look forward to the day that his father-in-law will come and give him advice? <laughs> Not necessarily, okay? All right. Well, this is one of those times where Jethro, and I'm not talking about Jethro Bodine, I'm talking about Jethro, uh, Moses' wife's daddy. Uh, he was there whenever Moses went running away from Egypt into the wilderness uh, 80 or 40 years before all this took place. And so he knew him. Uh, Moses left, went back, led the children of Israel out of the wilderness. And there is somewhere between 1.6 million people in the nation of Israel wandering around in the desert and 2 million people. Now, how many, is that a lot of people? Do you think that any of those people got mad at each other and had disputes? Okay. Moses was handling every single dispute that happened in there by himself. They would bring it to him. He would sit down. The people would wait in lines forever and ever and ever just to get to hear what Moses had to say. And Jethro comes out into the desert. His first time he's seen Moses probably in, in several years. And he looks and he watches and he sees what God is doing. And he says these words, picking up in verse 19. He says, now listen to me. I'll give you some advice. And God be with you. You be the one to represent the people before God and bring their case to him. 
instruct them about the statutes and the laws and teach them the way to live and what they must do. But you should select for yourself people, able men, uh, God-fearing, trustworthy, and hating bribes. Place them over the people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and ten. You see, that's kind of a structure like this. It just keeps, keeps going down like that. Then they can bring to you every important case but judge every minor case themselves. In this way, you will uh, lengthen, you will lighten your load and they will bear it and they will bear it with you. If you do this and God, and God so directs you, you will be able to endure and also all these people will be able to go home satisfied. So the people will be more happy and you'll still be alive to tell about it. Verse 24. Moses instructs, Moses listened to his father-in-law and he did everything he said. So Moses chose able men from all Israel and made leaders over the people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Then judged the people at all times, and they judged people all at all times. They would bring the hard cases to Moses, but he would judge, they would judge every minor case themselves. Then Moses said goodbye to his father-in-law and he journeyed to his own land and all God's people said. So part of the way to solve the problems that they had there was they brought in some more leadership to help help things. Um, have y'all noticed that over the last few years that Ridgeland Heights Baptist Church has grown? How, how many of you were members, active members at Ridgely in 1997? How many have to hold your hand up high, real high, say, so I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, probably a few more scattered out through the building. Back in 1997, uh, when, when I had the blessed privilege of coming here and, and becoming pastor, we, if we had a good Sunday, we had 60 people here. And we were tickled to death. I remember having 66 one of the first Sundays I was here and thinking, man, we're going to take on the world here with 66. Um, Easter Sunday morning between the sunrise service and the two morning services, we had 500, it was either 552 or 582 people who were in here. And uh, this past Sunday was the lowest Sunday we've had and I think we had 280 or 290, but most every other Sunday that we've had, we're running about 350 or so people on those two morning services in there. So over a 20-year period, the church has grown a lot, but it grew because people would step up and they would take care of the things that needed to be taken care of because... Uh, Originally, there's just a lot of different jobs. We created, Mitch and Dustin and I and Nita, we'll call it, we said we've created this monster because do y'all know any other churches that function quite the same way that Ridgely does? It doesn't because God calls special people to Ridgely. He's called you and he's called me and, and you may not know this. You may be upset to find out you're different from a lot of people. We're just all a little bit odd and he has brought us all together so that we can serve with the gifts and the talents that we have. And it's okay that we're different from each other. It's okay that we may be bent in a different shape, but God uses us in magnificent ways. And many of you have stepped up to be leaders. But I can see that we're at a preface right, a preface right now, and we're probably fixing to see some tremendous growth take place. That's why you've got a committee together while you're thinking about building another building over here so we can try to get everybody maybe in one service for a while. And, and those kinds of things. But uh, a church our size has just got to have a tremendous number of people who can step up and do those jobs. So that's the reason for the last three weeks and plus Dustin's will make four weeks that we've talked to you on some leadership stuff because we're hoping that God will get a hold to you and cause you be, to, to want to branch out and jump into one of the things that we've got going on. What I want to do tonight is I want to take the book of Proverbs. Y'all know where the book of Proverbs is? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw them up on the screen for you tonight, but you may want to write some of these down, and I just came up with 10, uh, what I, I, I'm, I'm going to call them leadership, uh, you know, things about, tonight I want to read a text that looks something like principles, uh, principles, principles of leadership from, uh, from the book of, uh, of uh, Proverbs tonight, what we want to look at. So here's the first principle I want you to try to remember here is this, seek to have a good name among the community. Somebody read out loud for me Proverbs 22, 1. You can either look it up in your Bible or just read it right there. Just Somebody stand up and read. 
Just one at a time, please. Just one at a time. Okay. All right. Yep. Oh. A good name is to be chosen over great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. I like the authority with which you read that too, brother. I appreciate that. That's how powerful. That sounds like a leader right there, doesn't it? Okay. All right. Um, what, what is a good name? What is a good name? Rep, reputation is in that name. Well, what if uh, what if you if you tear your reputation down? What does that do to your name? Yeah, and and and, and true. Do, does your parents' name make a difference on your on you? And do you make a difference on your children's reputation? So a good name is to be revered. A good name is to be chosen over great wealth. For it is better than silver, and it's better than gold. So what you want to do if you want to be a leader? You're gonna, you need to live your life in such a way that people respect who you are. Um, you want to make sure that you, that you tell the truth, you know, that you're honest with people. We're going to talk about several of these other things. But once you damage your character, it you takes years to go back and build those things back up. Many of you in here, probably mothers or whatever, told you, uh, daughters, you know, you can work on your reputation and you can build a reputation for years and years. But how many nights does it take to tear down a reputation? It takes one night. Takes one event or something. You know. So we, if, when you're going to be in a position of leadership, know that Satan's going to attack you from time to time. He's going to try to use things that he can to, 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 to make you look bad before others. Another leadership principle is we need to pursue wisdom always. Everybody say that. Pursue wisdom always. Um, a lot of times people have this mindset that you've got to learn what you need to know, and then after you know what you need to know, you don't have to learn anymore. When do you stop learning? The day you die. I'll take on with that, and then you're going to learn a whole bunch of new things in heaven, I hope, you know. Uh, I mean, I guess I hope you're in heaven. Not to, uh, <laughs> and I'm not saying that because you didn't want to be here tonight. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, no. <laughs> I'm going to be in big trouble. I'm uh, um, you know, we got to gain wisdom. It says in Proverbs, it says, don't abandon wisdom. And she, uh, don't abandon wisdom and she will watch over you, love her, and she will guard you. Wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get understanding. So it's so important to be able to, to, to discern and look at a set of circumstances and then figure out how to work in that particular set of circumstances. And that's one of the ways you kind of might know that you're being called into some leadership too. If you can look, uh, like Truman was saying a while ago, you got to look at the situation, you got to assess the situation, break it down into parts, figure out how you're going to handle this and then go forward with that. You may well be one of the people that's being called into a leadership type position. I know if you're going to work on a car, you got to assess, do some uh, trial and error to figure out what the problem is and you go buy the parts and you put them on there. You know, God just gives you uh, what you need to know to, to lead folks but you also, if you're going to be a leader, you need to look into the Word of God and study those leaders that are in there to see, see how they lead as well. Uh, Proverbs 16, 16, which I don't have on the board, says, Get wisdom. How much better is that than gold? And get understanding. It is preferable to silver. So if you're going to lead people, you've got to know a lot of stuff. And the best way to know a lot of stuff is to read a whole bunch. I uh, don't have a lot of these big memories from my head when I was a child because of some of the things that happened in my childhood and stuff, so I try to block some of that stuff out. But one of the things I remember is daddy, my daddy used to tell me that when the paper mill was hiring back in the 1945 to 1950 or so, they had a slogan, and their slogan was, send me a man who reads. Send me a man who reads. Why would their slogan be a man who, send me a man who reads? Because the more you read, and the more you soak into your head, the more knowledge you're going to have in there, and the better you're going to be equipped to handle the particular situations that you come in contact with. And so that's one of the things that motivated me to learn how to read, which many of you know I learned how to read after I graduated from high school. I just showed you how brilliant that I am, that I could graduate from high school reading on a sixth grade level. But anyway, you know, so, all right. Uh, third one here is develop community of, develop a community of counsel. Now, what in the world would I mean when I say a community of counsel? Anybody want to take a shot at what that might mean? All right. You want to associate your people, and you want to hang around people maybe who are smarter than you are. You know, don't we hear that about the presidency sometimes? 
Uh, he hires people that not, that's not as smart as he is or he hires people that's smarter than he is. When you have a set of counselors around you, the people that help you make your decisions, when they're smarter than you are or when they've got an abundance of information that you don't have, that you can make such better informa informed information when you got lots of information out there. Proverbs says, plans fail when there is no counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So when you get the right people giving you the information that you need to have, you're much more apt to be able to succeed at what you do. The negative flip side of that is like Proverbs 29, 12, which says, if a ruler listens to lies, all his officials will be wicked. And then another side, a good side of that, it says, is iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. Another uh, leadership tip or another uh, characteristic there is to develop the art of communication. How, how do you develop the art of communication? Communicate. Communicate. All right. Mike, uh, do you find that sometimes you speak to people and they didn't hear, they heard what you said, but they didn't hear what you said? Yeah, um, I, that, that, you know, I, how can you know that the person you talked to actually heard what you said? Well, they do exactly what you ask them to do, or, or what? You know, I, I find that I find a lot of times that it's best to go ahead and do lose, use what they call listening checks. Would you just tell me what I said? I learned to use listening checks because uh, I, that, that really helped between me and Tynell, especially in the early years, because I found out that she speaks female and I speak male, and those are two totally different languages, and everybody said, amen. amen. You can say two things, and it just means totally something, something different than that. We've got to learn how to communicate. It says in Proverbs 16, 23, a wise heart instructs its mouth. In other words, you, you figure out how you talk so that the person who is listening to you knows what it is that you have to say. It's not that you say it in the most eloquent way. It's that you say it in a way that they understand what it is that you're saying to them. Did that make any sense? If it didn't, I didn't I'm not doing a good job of this communication thing. Okay, a wise heart instructs in his mouth and increases learning with its speech. Uh, pleasant words are honeycomb, sweet to the taste and health to the body. Now, I have always been a firm believer that you can tell anybody anything if you will tell them that in the right way. Have y'all ever known somebody that would give you bad information and you were crushed by the way they said it and somebody else could give you the same bad information and when they said it, it didn't sound so bad? because they've worked on how it is that they're going to say those things. When you're in a position of leadership, you don't, you don't want to slap people in their face with that, you know, not only are you doing your job too slow, you're ugly and stupid too. You know, I mean, you know, you, know, you may want to walk in and say, you know, is there a way we can get this job done a little better than what, what we're doing? How can we increase productivity and get the people to talk to it? You know, there's just ways to communicate to folks to, to, to help that. Um, so you want to develop the, the art of communication. Uh, then the fifth one is trust God and don't be overconfident in your ability. Trust God and don't be overconfident in your ability because it's a guaranteed fail in Christian ministry if you're leading somebody and you think that you can do it and you think you've got the strength and the ability to do it, you will fall because Satan is bigger than you and he wants to topple everything that you, that you get involved in. That's why it says in Proverbs, pride comes before <coughs> destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. God always uses the people who know they don't have the ability to do it and they're going to have to rely on God to be able to accomplish it. That's, when, that's the people God's going to use because it's easier to get them out of the way than it is a person who's stuck on themselves and, and believes that they can do anything. Have y'all ever known those people that think they can do anything? They think they're the best baseball player. They think they're the best student, but they make C's and they, and they're, you know, and they, anyway, I've known a few of those people along the way. Uh, number six, develop a strong work ethic. Would somebody please look up Proverbs 6, 6 through 9 for me? Proverbs 6, 6 through 9. And while they're looking up, how many of y'all, does anybody have ants in their yard? 
anybody does those ants will bite you, won't they? You have lots of you know those ant bites are almost bad as catfish. You gotta watch out for them. Yeah. All right, uh, but the ant, okay, we got Jimmy, you got one on there? Brother Jimmy, read, read give me read it, read it like Levis does now. Read it with power and authority, you know, okay? <laughs> How many times you ever seen an ant taking a nap? <laughs> They're always on the move. I, you see an ant, you know, and he'll have a piece of cake over his head like this, carry it, you know. I'm going to carry it back and get, get you know, even got to dig a new hole to get it down in the ground. I mean, they're all up and ready to go. Uh, Proverbs 24, 30, uh, verse 30 through 34, it reads this way. It's kind of a flip side to say the same thing. I went by a field of a slacker and by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. Uh, thistles had come up everywhere. Weeds covered the ground and the stone uh, was, uh, the stone wall was ruined. I saw and I took it to heart. I looked and I received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms to rest, and your poverty will come over you like a robber, your need like a bandit. Oh, I made some of y'all yawn. I see two or three of y'all yawning out there as I said that. But you know, a little sleep, a little slumber. So that leader's got to be the person that, that goes ahead and jumps someone up out of the bed. It's got to be the person who gets up and says, we got to just go and, and get this done. You know, don't be afraid to make a mistake because you're going to. How many of y'all have ever made a mistake? All right. It's the one, I think one of the great sayings I learned from some of the people I worked with early on was, well, if you ain't never made a mistake, you ain't never done nothing, right? right? So it's just the way it is. The, the key is to learn from the mistakes. So. Okay. All right, seventh one is follow God and don't lead God. Have y'all ever been guilty of leading God? Okay, sitting down on your prayer list and telling God how he needs to fix everything and exactly how he needs to fix it. How many of y'all pray and tell God what he needs to do and then God says, yes, sir, and goes and does it? <laughs> that, you know, it amazes me how many people get mad at God and won't have anything to do with God because when they prayed, God didn't do what they told them to, what, they, what he told them to do. Right? You get, you're talking about the God of the universe right here. When God's looking for leaders, what he's looking for in a leader is somebody who will seek out what it is that God wants to do and then lead the other people to go follow what it is that God wants them to do. Don't boast about tomorrow because you don't know what a day might bring. You know, we, How many of y'all know that you'll be here tomorrow? You don't. You know, What's that saying that we say, I'll see you tomorrow? Lord willing, and what's the other one? And the creek don't rise, okay? Don't matter whether the creek rises or not if the Lord ain't willing, right? Okay? All right. So, so we've got to follow God instead of leading God. And you're gonna, a, a leader is going to spend an a, a more enormous amount of time in prayer trying to figure out it is, what it is that God wants to get accomplished. Okay? Another spiritual leader uh, guide here is avoid self-promotion like it is the plague. Have y'all ever known somebody that could give you a list of all of their accomplishments and they like to give you those accomplishments on a regular basis? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a little longer. It reaches back over here, doesn't it? Um, you know, I did learn a long time ago when you were hiring people, if they could tell you everything they'd ever done and how good they were at everything they did, you probably didn't want to hire them because they probably weren't any good at what it was that they did. You know, they, they boast about self. Proverbs 27.2. Somebody help me. Somebody stand up in, the, in a Levis-style voice and help me. Y'all are scared of the Levis. Oh, stand up at the Jimmy Larson-style voice. Okay, there you go. Okay, so is it evil to receive praise? Where's the praise supposed to come from? It comes from God and other people. Okay, it's okay. To, it's okay for people to praise you, but it's not okay for you to praise yourself and to and to toot your own horn, as my mama used to say. Okay, number nine, number nine, engine, engine, number nine, coming down the line. Okay, number nine, love the people that you lead. 
Love the people that you live. It's imperative that if you're going to be in ministry in any kind of job that you're doing in ministry, it's all about the people. You know, when we build buildings originally, we, we put this little building over here. It's not so we can have a new building. It's not so we'll look bigger. It's not so we have a bigger looking sanctuary over there. Why do we build buildings? Y'all know? So we can put people in the buildings. And why do we, why do we want people? Because we want to put people in the buildings so we can tell how many people we got at church on Sunday. So we don't get rained on. Okay, well, that is, that's a true statement that I'll have to say. But, so we can lead them to the Lord, but then once we lead them to the Lord, we're finished with them, right? No, no, no. We got to disciple them, right? We got to bring them to a knowledge of who they're supposed to be. So the whole thing, everything that we do at Ridgely has to do with people. Right? We want to do three things, don't we? What are the three things we want to do? Number one, we want to believe God. So when we believe God, we want to help other people believe in Jesus. Just like we believe in God, we want them to help them believe in Jesus under salvation. But then, what's the second thing we want to do? We and them want to become like Jesus. So now, are you starting to see a relationship pattern now? It's about us with us and us with God and us as individuals increasing our relationship with God and then we want to go out and we want to bear spirit-filled fruit. It's, it's all about the relationships. In fact, there's, there's two great commandments we keep, aren't they? What's the greatest commandment is? Love God. What's the second greatest commandment? Like love your neighbors yourself. So just love like I've loved you. Love like I've loved you. And that's a, that's a mighty tall command because he was willing to die for us, okay? All right, number 10, number 10, the last one. Embrace correction. Ooh, this is a tough one to learn. How many of y'all like for somebody to scold you and get on to you for being wrong? Okay. Wisely, oh, you like it? Plenty of practice, huh? Okay. Uh, you can attest to that. So it's a generational thing, right? Okay. Uh, okay. But you know, if, you, if somebody really loves you, they need to correct you. And one of the things that I learned from being a leader or different businesses and things through the year before, before I came up here, if somebody did something wrong, a lot of times I could just fix what they did wrong and then that would fix it, and then they wouldn't feel bad about me having to tell them that they did it wrong. Can anybody see a problem with me doing that? Because they're going to keep doing it wrong the same way over and over again. So unless I go have that confrontation, and I know I'm going to hurt their feelings when, they, when I tell them that they did it wrong, but if I really love that person, aren't I going to help them see that there's a better way to do that, and this is the way I'm going to do that? But now, doesn't that work in church work too, though? I mean, when we handle a situation with people incorrectly, you know, we can do we can do a better job than that. You know, so we want people. I the staff knows that it's okay for them to come and tell me, uh, "We think you're wrong on that." You know, it's uh, it's good. And if I if, if I think they're doing something wrong, I'm gonna tell them. I you can do that if you want to, but this is what I think I'm gonna see if that happens. Now we do always do that behind closed doors. Y'all don't see us doing that from from. Uh, open positions like this. But but we all need to be that way. We need to be able to we need to be able to take the correction that people give us. A lot of times people come into office and they're mad and upset about something and they unload and they leave the office and I have to admit to myself, well you know they're right. I didn't handle that thing right. So you have to readjust the way that you do things. I guess I, the reason I'm doing this thing is I want you to ask God if he is calling you into some types of leadership positions. And I know we're probably not going to be, you know, going out and putting people in leadership positions probably until July or August or something like that. But there's always things that need to be done. And if you see things that need to be done and you've got the ability to do them and you make and pull two or three or four or five or six folks to come alongside of you to go ahead and do them, jump in there and do that. Uh, rigidly structured different from most churches because it's the way... God called us to structure it. Structure it. We, don't, we don't have a staff meeting and then come and tell y'all what you're supposed to do. We lead you to Christ and we disciple you and we wait for the Holy Spirit to tell you what you're supposed to do and then you show up with us and say, why don't we as a church do such and such? And then we say, okay, well, we need a leader for that. And they say, who can we get to lead that? And we'll say, you. You see... 
because that comes, I think in the political world, they call that a grassroots movement. But it's, this is a true grassroots thing, the, the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit's priding you to, for us to do things, he may be calling you to lead that particular. If he's not, we'll, we'll help you figure that out too. Um, the last thing I want you to is be obedient to God's call. If God's calling you to step into somewhere and do it, just go and do it. I mean, it's, uh, come, come to us and we'll try to help you out. Anybody got any questions about anything we talked about tonight? Any leadership thoughts or anything? Okay. Probably going to do some leadership. That's, this is probably the last leadership message, and then we'll uh, probably do some training uh, later on in the year. And if you want to come to that, you'll be have an opportunity to do that. Okay, take your prayer sheet out if you would, and let's take a look at our prayer list here tonight.